Thank you. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests are the writer, director, and stars of the hilariously deadpan new film, The Art of Self-Defense. In it, Jesse Eisenberg plays a man who, following a traumatic beating at the hands of strangers, signs up for karate lessons with Sensei Alessandra Navolo. Let's take a look. Karate is a way of communicating. Ask me a question. What are your plans for the weekend? I'm going to do some grocery shopping and rent a film to watch in the comfort of my own home. home. Did that answer your question? I want you to tell me why you're here. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the dark. I'm afraid of other men. <laughs> I want to be what intimidates me. You came to the right place. I'm taking my first class today. Your new white belt? Is that the first belt color? White is before color. You haven't earned color yet. Today's lesson, to kick with your fists and punch with your feet. That makes perfect sense. Whoosh. Good. There's a mental component as well. Everything should be as masculine as possible. You may want to start on those reports. That pile is getting awfully high. Up. I won't be petting you anymore. This is for your own good. What's your favorite style of music? Adult contemporary. No, it should be metal. You're a blade and I'm sharpening you. I see a little of myself in you. Is that you, Sensei? Why are you filming this? This isn't a safe place, Casey. confused about what's happening. You have to trust me. You should have never started taking karate. You can't be weak anymore. I'm interested in buying a gun. I need something that can fit into my hand. Sounds like you're after a handgun. I challenge you to a fight to the death in unarmed combat. This is your belt. It is yours. It is sacred. There'll be a $15 charge to replace a lost belt. Everybody, please welcome Alessandro Novola, Jesse Eisenberg, and Riley Stearns. Let's hear it. Thank you. Uh, guys, thank you so much for being here. Uh, congrats on this movie. This movie fucking rules. Uh, thank you. I love this film so much, and I love that uh, it introduced me to you, Riley, as a filmmaker. You have one other film that came out a few years before this, and you are uh, such a unique, specific filmmaker who I feel like is going to develop a very specific body of work, which I very much look forward to watching over the course of your career. Um, how do you make a movie like this? It is so specific in tone. It is so deadpan. Uh, I I'm just curious how you direct your actors, what sort of direction you give them, what kind of questions do you guys have when you're going into a scene that on the page could be so big and so broad in a lot of ways? I mean, like you said, it's a specific tone. So a lot of it is is conversations prior to shooting, making sure that everyone's on the same page. Uh, but then on, on the day, kind of a lot of it is uh, is a very overt or a very on the nose or or specific uh, kind of kind of phrasing of things to where if they say it like a joke, it's not gonna work. So we would often just say that the character has to believe what they're saying and that's gonna be what makes it funny instead of trying to add something on top of something that's already big. Well, oftentimes saying it like a joke just means knowing timing, which is one of the reasons that I think actors are actors or are good actors. Sometimes both of these guys are very good actors. So you have a natural sense of timing. How do you remove that in a lot of ways? Because you are trying to create a different beat when it comes to these these jokes. Well, I suppose like timing still applies, but not in the kind of way that indicates to the audience that the characters are aware that they're being funny. Uh, like a good example of the of the opposite would be like Friends, where it's like six people and they're all actually funny people and they're kind of indicating to each other that they're making each other laugh. And There's literally a guy raising an eyebrow close in close up every time a joke is made. Right. Whereas like this, the no one's ever trying to be funny. I don't think like humor doesn't even exist in the world of this movie. Like no one's no one makes a joke. Nobody laughs in the movie. Right. right nobody yeah, yeah. laughs or smiles or enjoys anything. And so um, <laughs> and so like the characters are just being completely earnest and. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's like kind of 
a more progressive form of comedy because it's postmodern and it I think takes comedy to the next level where you're not kind of handing the audience the kind of you know the the key to the key to the the kind of behind the scenes way of uh, that the characters are feeling. What about you, Alessandro? Who your character is overconfident, he's brash in a lot of ways, but you constantly have to sort of undersell that as an actor to sort of go along with the tone of the film. Uh, yeah, somebody, some friend of mine who saw the movie recently described him as cunning and stupid, <laughs> which <laughs> I think is kind of the perfect way of describing it. And that was what made me want to play the character. Is It's totally confusing because on the one hand, he's really kind of good at, at seducing people into his dojo. And, uh, uh, and on the other hand, everything that he says is idiotic. Um, technically, I guess, I, the main thing I remember was that I had to take a really deep breath before I spoke because if you, if you take a breath in the middle of a lot of these lines, it doesn't work. Yeah, there's there's a lot of I, I don't realize when I write like how complicated something can be until we're trying to say it later on and and all I, I'm trying to get better at just saying lines to myself and saying is that something that a human should actually say <laughs> or it, it is po like capable of well, saying because you, you guys he, he it writes out. with these like what are they called subordinate clauses do you know oh, what I don't that know. Is? <laughs> Yeah, like you're saying something and then there's like a parenthetical statement in the middle of it and then it goes back to the original yeah. sentence and in that parenthetical statement is like something totally absurd and you just say it like you just continue right through it and get back to the original thing you were saying <laughs> without pausing or stopping to like highlight it at all and that's where the joke is. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of that's in the edit too. So did you find a lot of times on set that you had to lear sort of learn this process or like something that you would normally figure out in rehearsal beforehand? You had to sort of find it in the second, third or fourth take often? Yeah, and that... And I don't think there were third or fourth <laughs> takes. Not a lot of them. I mean, you shot in 21 days, right? 20, so you 25, but so okay. we had a lot of action. We had dogs, we had kids, we had stunts, everything in between, so... Yeah, the, the difficulty was not laughing because the characters are so earnest. Like, when a character is a funny person, you can kind of laugh while you're saying the joke because right. the character is somebody who understands that what they're saying is funny and therefore laughing because they're sane. But in this movie, none of the characters find themselves funny, so the more earnest... So we ended up finding it funny, you know, the more you're suppressing a laugh, the funnier it is. And so that was the only, that was the only reason to continue to do the scenes over and over. Uh, Riley, you know, you, uh, you take jujitsu, right? And, uh, and I think you also listen to metal. I've read, I've, or you used to at one point listen to a lot of metal and so much of a, so much of this movie is about a kind of perversion of these things that are, are, are masculine or technic or normally considered masculine, like, martial arts or like metal music. Uh, what made you interested in sort of perverting the idea of these things that you, 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 you love? I think that the metal scene in general takes itself to a little too seriously. I think that martial arts and MMA and all of, uh, sports in general tend to kind of have a, a seriousness about them or, or kind of put themselves on a pedestal maybe above art or whatever it is. And so even though I enjoy these things, I also have a sense of humor about myself and I, I do like to think that uh, you can make fun of things that you like, it's okay. And so, I, I, but also I really just wanted to put metal in a movie. I wanted to put martial arts in a movie. Like I, I, I was having trouble writing a script before this that didn't really go anywhere. And I started asking myself, why don't I just do something in the world that I love? And jujitsu at the time was a new hobby for me, but it was a passion of mine. And I, I thought it'd be, well, it'd be really cool if I could do jujitsu in between takes and like get to use the mats that we're using. And, and so it really w just came out of a selfish want, a desire to make something about stuff that I loved. Did you find that uh, making something about something that you love and being in that world already, it was easier for you to pull details in as a, as a writer and that sort of helped with the process? Yeah, I, I would say that we're, I was pulling details that I kind of noticed, uh, like the first uh, class that Casey, Jesse Eisenberg character takes in the movie, uh, he doesn't know how to tie his belt, so he ties it kind of backwards and then the straps are really long and you see that with every student that comes in and tries a class, like they do, you actually start from the front, not the back, like type of thing. And that's a detail that I think people who train uh, will 
people will pick up on and be like, oh, whoever wrote that either did a lot of interviews or trains themselves. And I, I didn't want to inundate uh, or over overdo it with the with the details, but I also it, it was fun to put those little kind of nods uh, to it in the in the film. I also don't think you overdo it or get heavy handed when it comes to the commentary on masculinity, but it's absolutely there and i think especially when it comes when we talk about mma or we talk about karate or metal music when you were writing this what were you thinking about why did you want to talk about this version of these things that can be violent and ab abhorrent and kind of misused when in the wrong hands particularly the the and when talking about masculinity at the time that i was writing the script uh and and leading up to it i just started asking myself more questions and, and, and kind of accepting that I had these fears of who I was as a man. Do I relate to other men or, or is there like this sense of fear around other men? Um, and in talking to other people after the movie and even people who are reading the script as I was writing it, uh, especially other men, they were telling me that they had these same thoughts and fears but nobody was talking about it. And even like outside of fears, just men don't talk about their feelings with other men. Uh, they're afraid to go to therapy, whatever it is. I, I think- The worst, we should talk about it all the time. It's actually really fun to talk about. And it, it actually is. It's nice to know that people are going through shit that you're going through and it's we can relate in a different way than maybe a woman can relate to you and vice versa. And I, I just, I think that uh, for me, it was it was interesting to talk about things that I was was actually thinking about, but doing it in the context of a martial arts film and some hopefully subverting the expectations of what that film is going to be about. Uh, Jesse, you know, I read an interview where you said that oftentimes you get characters that don't feel fully developed, and that one of the things that attracted you to this movie that was that the tone and the character itself may have been the most fully developed character on the page that 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 you had ever played. Did that pose challenges for you, or does that make the job easier in a way? Well, it's the character is is developed, but it also the character is also uh, a product of this world where people don't really exist before and after the moment that you're meeting them. So the character is really wonderful, but it's also not a character you typically see in a movie. It's a character that kind of has no real inner thoughts based on the besides the ones you're kind of seeing immediately. Like the movie takes place in this very strange universe. You can't place it. You can't place the geography, you can't place the time period, and the characters are kind of extensions of that. They kind of exist in this moment, right? And they kind of exist for the purpose that they're serving at that moment. I mean, he's such a brilliant writer, and one of the things he's able to do is have this kind of, there's a kind of earnestness with which all the characters speak, and a, and, and a sincerity, but they also don't really have a personality outside the purpose that they're serving for the given character. And in the case of my character, it seems like the world is almost in opposition to him. Like, no one likes him, everybody ignores him, and then even, and then like in the opening scene, there are these two people speaking French near him, and they start making fun of him, thinking, of course, that he doesn't speak French, and the next moment you realize that actually he does know French. So like, the world is just set up to kind of hate him. But what I love about that is I feel like I've seen that in movies before, and that's generally a trope of a main character, that like we have to get this. But you somehow even subvert that trope in a way because the world itself, and once he sort of joins that world, we see that he kind of wants to make fun of something as well, that he is sort of searching for some sort of hostility or violence for himself, which obviously isn't the entirety of the movie, but it doesn't just become one where he exacts vengeance on that world or becomes a better person right away because of that. No, it's 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 definitely, it's the film itself is very black and white in the way that the characters relate to each other, but I think that there's a lot of gray in the way that I went about making the movie and, and the way that I wrote it. Uh, I, I was asked earlier today about uh, kind of what you're saying, that we all have this kind of within inside of ourselves so or within ourselves so he may be beaten down and and like experiencing these things that that anybody else would be uh, kind of thrown by but when he gets to a place where he can actually kind of do good he still embraces the darkness that maybe is within him uh, a little bit and I think that that's human nature like I, I I was remembering a story when I was in sixth grade, picking on a kid who was nerdier than I was, and I was a nerd, so that was like saying a lot, but only because I thought I could, and then he pushed me back, and then I snapped out of it, and I realized, like, why am I doing this? But I think that you, everyone has that kind of thing inside of them. Alessandro, your character constantly talks about masculinity and presenting an idea of masculinity and how Jesse's character could be more masculine, metal, karate, a different dog. So silly. Uh, but you yourself as an actor didn't, I, it's not like you muscled up for the part or did anything to really like show off these like sort of classically masculine ideas of what a sensei would be. What made you not do that? And did that come from a conversation with Riley? Did you ever think that you had to do that for the character? I didn't really have time. Uh, I, I was offered the job like a week or two before we started. And so it was all I could do 
the weekend that I arrived in Louisville where we shot it to learn those two routines that uh, I had to do, uh, you know, the, the two karate routines. And there was this awesome stunt coordinator who came to my um, hotel room and just, like, we drilled it for, like, 48 hours and then shot it the first day. But, yeah, I, there was definitely no time to, like, change my, you know, Christian Bale style. Uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> but, but we did Gain also... or lose lots of weight. <laughs> we, we did have conversations about, like, his character is as... Uh, he's, he's in power and he's got this, like, charisma about him and he's got this cool about him. But he also walks around the dojo with a shirt tucked in, uh, socks with sandals. Like, we like to think that inside the dojo he had this power about him and he had this control over these, his students and that he legit knew what he was talking about and knew karate... But outside of the dojo, he's probably picked on just as much as Casey's character. I say in the in the movie, uh, you remind me of myself a bit. Before, well, originally I used to say, he cut this out, but I used to say, you remind me of myself uh, before I became a man. <laughs> <laughs> Bleaker um, street note. But, um, yeah, I, but I think actually like almost everything I say in the movie, uh, it's completely true. Like, I, I just sort of always say what, is true and um oh you know for the character and so yeah i think he was kind of somebody like uh jesse's character and who just found this one kind of little arena where he could lord it over everybody and uh kind of make himself feel empowered and yeah i mean things like the the tiva sandals kind of like <laughs> are the little clue that, uh, you know, he's not what he appears to be. And, and once we kind of found those little costume pieces and stuff, um, it kind of, you know, came together in terms of I could just keep playing the same thing and those things were undercutting it all the time, you know, the high-waisted jeans and, you know, wearing the, the belts that he gave me with pride and all that kind of stuff. I wonder, was there is there ever hesitation on your part when you're when you're writing this and then when you're on set to not make the character more seductive to the audience because you're putting a, you're sort of creating this world where we have to believe that he's seductive to these characters, but to us we're questioning why he's considered so masculine or why he is the leader of this dojo, and it works for a viewer like me. I get that joke, but it also takes guts on the part of a filmmaker like yourself to realize that you're not really maybe incorporating an entire audience who needs their hand held a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to hold anybody's hand, but I also trusted Alessandro, and I think that a lot of that is just on his shoulders, that he's got he's got to say these incredibly, at times, they turn into really misogynistic and, and sadistic uh, kind of thoughts. They're coming out of his head and and Jesse's character is a sponge and he's soaking up everything as if it's fact and if because he's so earnest but uh, I, I didn't want him to be so overtly cool that we questioned then my motives of like why are we making him so cool why are we trying to seduce or why is he trying to seduce us instead it, it was kind of a balance of the character needed to have this innate uh, I guess talent and and charisma, but then Alessandro had to bring that too. It was it was a it was a balance that and mainly a lot of, like I said a lot of it fell on Alessandro. Hey, did you guys go back before you did the film? Did you guys go back and watch Faults? Because I'm always curious about um, a filmmaker's such a specific tone, how that carries over into the scripts and whether or not you can see it in the script or you had to watch Faults and be like, oh, now I really understand what he's what he's going for with this writing. Um, for me, like I think the script was like pretty self-explanatory. Like when you see that everybody has a name that is the name of their job. Like normally it says like John, and then it's his dialogue. But in Riley's scripts, all the people just have the names of the thing they do, like sensei or cashier or man with dog. Like everybody, even <laughs> big parts. So like I, I, you have like a sense that oh, this is the tone is skewed a little bit, and it's kind of blunt in a comic way, um, while still being sensitive and everything. What struck me about his other movie. And, and the way I filtered this movie through it was that his other movie is explicitly about cults. And when I read this movie, um, The Art this of Self... What's that? This is as well, yeah. Yes, but you know, I think now, because the movie's coming out now and because we're talking about kind of like, you know, the dangers of the modern, you know, masculine man and, you know, and, and the dangers that, uh, you know, um, of toxic masculinity, so to speak, like, um, kind of people, I think people are filtering the movie through the kind of commentary on that and seeing it as a satire of masculinity. But um, when I read this movie, it was before that kind of conversation. And uh, I just viewed it as a movie about a cult. You know, I mean, the, the, he is the perfect cult leader. He is authoritative. He's 
overly confident, um, and you could probably say deeply insecure uh, if you were able to project or extrapolate. And my character is like the perfect cult member. Like he has no other life. He has no one in his life to tell him what he's doing is not a good idea. He's deeply lonely, and he has no like inner conviction about anything. So he's a perfect, a perfect kind of uh, vessel. He has no idea really like who he is at this point. He's as broken as like a person could be. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And to be fair, the tone of faults, I, I knew that I needed to get my first feature made and this would never have been a first feature. Nobody would have ever made, let me make this as a first feature because it balances such a tone and I don't know that it really should have been made in some ways. Like I, I, the fact that a producer actually said yes to it is still incredible to me. But um, why is that? Why do you feel like this shouldn't shouldn't have been made? I mean, I get what you're like saying. Like on, pa on paper, yeah. uh, I, I just I, you're, uh, it's a dark comedy set in the world of karate, and it's about masculinity and 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 control, and uh, it just it doesn't like scream like money maker. And I do think that that's that's something that producers should look at is uh, you you don't you don't want to make movies that don't uh, get an audience because then you're not going to eventually be making movies. And so I I do think that it took some bravery on the part of our producers. And uh, I I do think that me making a film that's like sort of in that direction with faults, but then pushing it even further uh, the second time around, this is where I want to be more. But what faults was really just me needing to show that I could start that. Uh, it, it was kind of like a step in this. Direction. Yeah, I was struck by, as a person who just watched Faults this morning before you got here in self-defense last week, I was struck by how Faults had more, for lack of a better way to put it, a dramatic arc in a way, or at a certain point, like about halfway through the second act, it really just becomes a drama and loses a lot of the deadpan comedy that had been happening prior to that, where this just dives head first into being deadpan from beginning to end. That's not to say it doesn't have an arc, but it's different. What made you have the confidence to just to, to shoot for that that uh, that tone. I just really wanted to push the absurdity more. Faults never totally loses its sense of humor, but it does kind of turn into more of a hybrid thriller. Some people call it horror at times, but it's never surreal or, or I guess never supernatural. Uh, with this one, I really wanted to just push that this is its own world. Faults is more about a deprogramming. It's a, like a specific time period. It's mid 80s. It's it's about it it's exists in our in our world just ever so slightly removed. Whereas this is its own world, and in its own world, it's uh, or because it's in that own world, we can have fun with it. We can push it further, and you'll see. Like hopefully, when people watch it, they'll they'll see what I mean. But uh, things can happen that wouldn't happen here. Have you ever had the chance, Alessandro, to play like a charismatic cult leader type? You played charismatic before, but not necessarily like one who is leading and manipulative, have you? Uh, no, I mean, I definitely never played a role like this, which was, you know, one of the big draws about it for me. I mean, I've played other characters that, I don't know, like my character in Laurel Canyon, the movie I did with Fran McDormand, he, he was a little bit of a kind of you know, cheeky manipulator and... Neon Demon? You know, he was a... Oh, oh yeah, Neon, Neon Demon. Demon. Yeah, I mean, I've played some sort of comically nefarious people but definitely they, they weren't you know the same character even close and I definitely saw an opportunity to to play something a character in a style that I had never really tried my hand at so how does that style affect you as an actor when you're on set and you think that you're playing like a charismatic cult leader in a lot of way but the style is like you are not charismatic at all for the actual audience of the movie I mean you it's hard to describe. You have an awareness of the world of the movie and that the things that you're saying are patently absurd, um, but you commit to saying them with, you know, total belief. And, you know, I, I, it's not like you're stepping out of yourself while you're performing, but there is something about, you know, tonally about the way you're delivering your lines where you're aware that you're in a comedy. I mean, it, it's not like... I wasn't sort of confused and thinking I was in a different movie than I was, but uh, but <laughs> you know you have to but you have to you have to play it you have to commit to it and play it and we both were all the time you know and you only laugh when you like you only like actors I feel like only laugh when you for a second see 
see outside yourself and yeah. see you, you you picture for a split second what it looks like and and it, it makes you laugh because I mean there's times where we would be talking yeah. and you know just completely like you know, right. talking seriously about something and then some you then you hear yourself say something that's right. so completely dumb or whatever right. that, right. that yeah. you have to laugh and yeah. to be fair Alessandro is incredibly charismatic even when he's saying these horrible things and that's I think where like all of the uh, confusion in the audience starts like you really like this guy in some ways and and in his mind, he's totally steering Casey down this proper path. He's not doing anything nefariously. In his mind, he's doing the right thing. But he's saying it in such a horrible way, and he's doing it in such a horrible way. And I, But then it's still Alessandro saying those lines. I do think that there's this, like, uh, I, I don't know, the way that the audience perceives it is, is still kind of confusing and fun. But then they still are rooting against him, but they also like him. It's, it's, it's a very peculiar place to be as an actor, I, I would imagine. Well, you sort of sprinkle it on lightly at first, where you sort of start wondering about this guy, even with the metal music thing, where it's like, where would he get this idea that metal is masculine? I also have a, work I have a story way. behind it. Like, I feel like it, he went probably went to the record store not knowing what the most masculine music is <laughs> and said to the guy, like, what's the most masculine like music you can find? And the guy said, well, there's this thing called grindcore and then there's power violence. And he's like, I like the sound of that. Like, power violence, that sounds good to me. Or so he we like, saw one there. guy there who looked masculine to yeah. him and was like, what do you listen to? Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who has a question right here? Hi. Um, I was wondering at what point in the writing process did you decide um, you would do no geographic location or no time period? Uh, for this movie, it kind of was always the way that I wanted to go about it. I wanted it to feel like it was its own world. So the nondescript location thing made sense in terms of the, the tone of the movie and uh, ease of kind of just like, see, or I don't know, like easing into its own world. But also, thinking about it uh, from a fiscal standpoint, I really did say, like, I w it'd be nice to be able to shoot wherever we can get a great tax incentive. And, yeah, I mean, honestly, that was part of it as well, just saying we, we could shoot this anywhere. And that was a thing that I was able to tell producers. And my producer said, well, how about Kentucky? And I said, yeah, let's do it. So Louisville, Kentucky, of all places. I, 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 and we ended up loving shooting there. And the, the people were great and the crews were amazing. So if we had set it in Seattle or even just like uh, Central Texas or something like that, I'm from Austin, uh, I w we would have had to shoot it there. And that becomes like a budgetary thing that you have to consider. It just made it easier in a lot of ways. So smart. Oh, thanks. Uh, but that said, that what's so interesting about that is that it, while it could be any time, for me as a viewer, I was like, this is like 1995. Maybe that is just every time now, America at this point, where that's no longer 1963 anymore, or whatever it was, 1995 is the previous point that feels like just general America, right? Like desktop computers and khakis. Totally. Yeah. Uh, one more. Hi. Um, I was wondering, because since it's so difficult to pinpoint exactly in w at what time the movie is happening, how did you guys go about your research um, for each of your characters? Um, it, it's interesting. This is like kind of a movie that doesn't require like thinking of like, I don't know what you might say in acting school is like a backstory for the characters, right? Because it's not really a... It's not really like a, a, the world, a world in which these characters really existed before the movie starts, right? Well, I, I guess in my case, I there kind of were all these clues laid in, um, like there are pictures on my desk and little things that I've kept in my desk that Riley really kind of slyly and stealthily just p lays in there without calling attention to them, but they're there. And then, you know, my cleaning up the dojo and <laughs> washing the toilet on my own. And I love that sequence so stuff. much. He's still a small like, business owner. <laughs> You know, all those to me were like, gave some kind of hint about a, a kind of lonely, you know, backstory, a, a lonely life of somebody who just never kind of fit in or felt that comfortable in his own skin and maybe had a marriage that wasn't quite working and maybe he's gay or, you know, I, any of any number of possibilities. But, and, and I, you know, I take your point. Like, it wasn't, the, you know, like a, <laughs> like a, a movie that demanded sort of, that you write your character bio or something, but I did enjoy those things that he put in the script that I knew were going to kind of almost go unnoticed, but that the audience would just catch enough to kind of fill out some something about the character that's unexpected. Now the placement of the cleaning the dojo sequence is so is such a beautiful punchline to to the movie at that moment. Like so much has happened, and they just. Shh, shh, 
yeah, so da- ridiculous. Dave, David Zellner's uh, in the film, and he's a director. He did Kamiko Treasure Hunter and Damsel along with his brother. And uh, after he read the script initially, he called and he was just like, I love that he's still, after like all this horrible stuff is happening, he's still at the end of the day is running a small business. And he has to like take care of the day-to-day tasks. And uh, that was that was always a fun part of the movie. Is that where that idea was sort of born out of? Was just that he would still have to, or was it... I, I think placed where it is for me as I was writing it, I never really thought of it literally like that, but it was more just like those scene, those shots would be a funny uh, counter to what you had just seen. Uh, but when David described it as that, I was like, yeah, I mean, of course. He, no, he does He's also too, uh, uh, too, I don't know, like careful with his money to hire somebody else. He's like, he ha- hires people by giving them lessons. Like that's that's how he pays them. So uh, he, he does all of the small menial tasks on his own to save a little money at the same time. But they're also just placed in a funny part of the film, I, I, I hope. Um, guys, I love the film so much. Congratulations Thanks on so making much. something Thank you. totally unique and crazy and uh, hilarious. It opens this week, right? This yeah, Friday? This Friday, Austin, uh, LA, New York, and San Francisco. And then it expands the following week. The Art of Self-Defense. Everybody give them a huge round of applause for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.